Look, I really don't want to do this, but I have to start off with some bad news. It's more of a disclaimer, really, but I just want to make sure that each and every single one of us is on the same page. So here goes nothing. I'm a mathematician. <laughs> now, before you go looking for the exits, there is some good news. And the good news is that this talk is not really about mathematics, OK? But it is about mathematical physics. And I'll leave that up to you to decide whether that's good or bad. <laughs> so what do I do? Well, I study gravity, or what we perceive as gravity, and how it affects the motion of objects in space, like satellites. Now, since the dawn of the space age, we've launched about 8,000 satellites into orbit. About 5,000 are still there, and about 2,000 are still active, fully operational, and probably used by many of us here today. So on that note, can you imagine a world without satellite technology? You'd have to be able to read and navigate your way through a city using a physical map. You'd have to walk into a bank and actually speak to a human being. And worst of all, you'd have to go out on a Saturday night Bring home your own takeaway. <laughs> this is truly the stuff of nightmares. So what do these systems of satellites do? Well, let's take one example. Now, one system of satellites that is an absolutely indispensable tool for every person in this room is the global positioning system. Now, the GPS is a system of satellites which provide global navigation services completely for free. GPS satellites are whizzing around above the Earth, 20,000 kilometers away, zipping past each other at about four kilometers a second. So to put that into perspective, by the time I finish this talk today, a GPS satellite will have traveled a distance from Adelaide to Melbourne three times. So obviously, we don't just use the GPS to get us home after late night shopping. It's relied upon by industries such as telecommunications, internet, banking, it can aid emergency services in search and rescue missions, or it can help us predict severe weather warnings. That's just one system of satellites. Now, collectively, we've gotten so used to the concept or the idea of having everything at the click of a button or the tip of our finger, this has led to a massive boom in space-based services. Now, whether you like to believe it or not, every person in this room relies on satellite technology on some scale. But you might say, well, well Joe, like, is that a problem? Look, sitting back on a Sunday afternoon, drinking a cold beer, watching satellite TV, is definitely not a problem. But a major consequence of this boom in space-based services is the creation and emergence of space debris and the effect that it has on our near-Earth environment. So what is space debris? Space debris is anything that orbits the Earth that is man-made and not functioning. Examples include used stages of rockets. It could be old, out-of-service, defunct satellites. It could be fragments from satellites colliding, or it could be something as small as a fleck of paint. And the next question is obvious. So who cares? If it's far away, is it doing any harm to us? Well, not directly, but let's take an example of some consequences. So if a debris object, maybe 10 centimeters or more, like my phone, came into contact with a GPS satellite, it wouldn't just put a dent in it, it would render the object completely useless. Now, that's just a small consequence. The big picture here is that debris has a domino-like effect with itself. And what I mean by that is that when debris collides together, it creates more debris. Now, this will really hinder our future accessibility to space, and will also limit our prospects of using new technologies with space-based services. Now, here's the real bad news. So, at the minute, we currently track about 22,000 debris objects. 2,000 of them, like I said, are active satellites, and the rest is complete junk, garbage. Now, that sounds pretty bad, but it gets a lot worse, because that is just the objects that we can track so according to the European Space Agency, there's at least 34,000 objects which are greater than 10 centimeter, 
and up to 128 million debris objects between one millimeter and one centimeter. So to put that in perspective, the image behind me is a simulation of 100,000 objects. So in order for this image to accurately reflect the findings of the European Space Agency, we would only have to add another 127.9 million more objects. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a weekly bin service that comes along and cleans up the problem. And now you'll be happy to know there is some good news here, and that is debris that is relatively close to the Earth will return and burn up in our atmosphere. But there are ideal highways in space, like this disk-like structure behind me, which have the perfect settings for certain systems of satellites, telecommunication satellites and so on. Now, because of these settings are so perfect, their optimum is getting extremely crowded out there, and if a debris object made its way out there, it would never return to Earth. Now, this is cause for major concern. Okay, I'm hoping I've put the fear of God into you now. So what I would like to talk about now is what can a mathematician do about this? Well, what do mathematicians do? We model things. And how do we model objects in space? We look at the forces that act on them. And luckily for me, the main driving force behind the motion of all of these objects is gravity. Now, when it comes to actually modeling objects in near-Earth orbit, what we do is we look at the dominant forces. So first of all is gravity, and then we add in the remaining forces as needs be. Now, these extra forces are what's called non-gravitational forces, and these largely depend on the characteristics or properties of the object you're trying to model. So for a GPS satellite, that's no problem. We know what it looks like, we know its orbital regime, all these nice things. However, for a space debris object, we don't know these quantities, we don't know these properties. So this process is a potential source for error. So if gravity is the dominant force acting on these objects, then it is absolutely critical that we get this component of the modeling correct. Because we can't say for certainty that we're doing the other forces 100% justice. Well, is that a problem? We've known how gravity works for years, correct? You throw something up, goes to the ground. Problem solved. Well, no, gravity is not that simple. It's extremely complicated. We currently have two theories of gravity that we regularly draw from. One is from Isaac Newton, aptly named Newtonian gravity. And the other is from Albert Einstein, not so aptly named general relativity. Now, in terms of modeling, all we cared about is the following. Newtonian gravity is what's called linear linear and easy to model. General relativity is non-linear and not so easy to model. But mathematicians don't care about that, whether it's hard or not, that's our job. And general relativity is our currently accepted theory of gravity, whether we can do high-level maths or not. It gives rise to all these cool things we hear in the news, like black holes colliding, gravitational waves, and all that. Now look, I'm not gonna stand here and tell you a bold-faced lie. Modeling space debris is not as cool as modeling a black hole. I'm sure we can all agree. But space debris is an immediate problem that requires our attention before it's too late. So I thought, how can I exploit my knowledge of gravity to try and better model these objects? Like, I am a mathematician. I can't go up there and take it down myself. So what I did as part of my PhD is I looked to try and simulate these orbits using the full theory of gravity, general relativity. So what that means is we don't worry about the Newtonian part. We just use the full theory of general relativity the way it's meant to be used. Now, this is not going to solve the problem of space debris, but it is a step in the right direction to try and help reduce or at least better model these objects. Now, you're not expected to leave here and go, well, now I understand general relativity, because it takes years, and I've done it, and trust me, sometimes I'm still a bit stuck. But what I would like to leave you with is this sort of sense of, a, I guess, like impending doom for the future. <laughs> Obviously, the problem is not that bad. So when Mary and Bob go out to their car tonight, a GPS satellite is not going to fall and hit you in the head. But our way of life, and frankly, our cozy and privileged way of life, could be massively impacted uh, if, it, if a solution is not sought. So tonight, when you're sitting in the pub and you're having a beer and you're saying, what on earth was that Irish guy talking about? The only thing I want you to remember is that when you look up at the night sky, 
you're not just looking up at the stars and the planets, you're looking directly through our very own man-made, space-based, earth-orbiting landfill. Thank you. <laughs>